Thank you for having us in your office. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you for coming. So, born in Nyeri. How was that for you, growing up well, there? Yeah. Well, I spent a few years in Nyeri, and I think uh, the first seven years of my life. And um, very interesting, very exciting. Um, school? You went to school there? Nyeri Primary School, yes. And um, it was fun. It was um, forested, it was green, it was cold. It's nice. So when did you leave Nyeri? Um, 1967. You were how old? Uh, seven years old. Okay. Your family relocated, or was it school? Relocated to Nairobi. Uh huh. So just you or siblings? The entire family. Yeah. Do you yeah, have siblings? One brother. One brother. Yeah. So talk to us about where you went to school. So after Nyeri Primary in Nyeri, I moved to Nairobi. Nairobi moved to Hyrish Primary School for my primary education, and then Jamuri High School for my secondary education. And then um, I went to USIU. Mm. What did you study? Um, at USIU, I did a BSc in Business Administration uh, with Accounting and Financial Management. So your family was well off. Childhood was good. Anything you wanted, you got. Not everything. Um, okay. They were, they were struggling. They were hustle, hustling. And they moved from um, Nyeri without anything and started a new business. My father started many businesses, shut them down and kept on. And he started Bitco Clothing Factory in 1970, three years after we moved to Nairobi. And uh, he had a driving school in Nyeri. He started mm. the driving school in uh, Nairobi. It was your driving school. And yeah, it wasn't uh, all easy. It was tough for him. Yeah, but he kept on. He was an entrepreneur from, from start, and I think he's hustled through his life all along. He started his career in uh, Mombasa. He was born in Mombasa. And he worked at the port as a casual laborer. And um, he had to leave school um, at young age because uh, he couldn't pay the fees. Yeah. Fifteen shillings per term, he couldn't pay the fees. Wow. So was he involving you uh, as his uh, children in business as he was trying out all of these different ventures? You're seeing them start, seeing them fail. Were you involved or were you just seeing things as they unfold? We were observers. We would uh, go to where his clothing factory was, observe what's happening and be a part of the process, but we weren't involved in the business itself yeah. um, until late because um, it was um, around 1980s when um, actually uh, 1980s when he closed down the clothing factory in 81, 82 um, we joined up and said fine, what do we do now? We looked at fast moving consumer goods but also at the same time, he had this um, clothing factory and we said, can we take it backwards into cotton processing, cotton farming, the whole value chain. Yeah. That's when the whole idea came up, to do the value chains. So we'll talk about business a little later, but let's um, come back to you growing up, going to school. What are you aspiring to do? But your father was an entrepreneur. What is it you thought for you in terms of the path you wanted to follow? I think by looking at him, and he was an icon in that sense for me uh, and for my brother, um, clearly, we just wanted to be our own bosses and be yes. entrepreneurs, um, not to be working for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was in university, you know, uh, looking at that, I said, let me also look at an alternative. And I joined American Life Insurance, Alico, as an insurance salesman. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to sell. So you were employed? No, it was a, it was an insurance agent. So it's not an employed, but you're working as an insurance agent on your own and going and telling people, you know, buy a life insurance policy. Okay. And the fact you tell people that they're going to die and they need some insurance, uh, out of 100 people you meet, 97 are rejections to say, hey, let's talk later. Because yeah. uh, nobody, nobody thinks they're going to die and people don't want to talk about insurance. Mm. So yeah, it, 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 it helped me in my formative age to say, fine, uh, that's something I don't want. Yeah, you want to do your own business. Um, you're married? Yes. And a son? Married, I have one son, yes. Talk to us about your family, how you met your wife. Um, me and my wife was an arranged marriage. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So the arranged marriage is where you are introduced to a girl and um, it's your choice. It's not uh, dependent on them. And both of us chose to, to get married. Okay, because I, I figured arranged means this is Sophia, take it or take it. 
No. So you had a choice not to get into no, it? No, the arranged marriages these days, in the past used to be like that. My dad and mom had that problem. Yeah. But uh, for us it was more of, here's an introduction, talk to them, and if you feel compatible then get engaged. So it was arranged on the basis of what, for the, uh, the planners, the arrangers of this, they felt that the, um, compatibility would be what, family background? I think what happens is the, the relatives do the due diligence. Mm. So they actually see all the family background, where they're coming from, what's happening, the right stuff, and then that's what they introduce you to. So it's pretty much arranged in that sense. So introduction is you come with your folks, she comes with her folks, you're having dinner together, or are you told, oh, so go to this place and you'll meet so-and-so. How does that work? No, um, it's probably formal. It's <laughs> formal where you're actually called together mm -hmm. and then says, here's a girl, Here's a boy, see each other, and you get a background check on that to tell you what's the background and where they come from. And then, yes, you can uh, spend your time together with the girl for a few hours and uh, find out. So, for you, you met her? Was it love at first sight? Or did you go like, oh, Lord? <laughs> no, it was, um, it was interesting because it was the first meeting and um, I was the one questioning a lot. And she was just observing and giving the answers, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess uh, within two, three meetings, we met two, three times after that, and yeah, we both said, yeah, compatibility was there, so we accepted. So how old were you at this time when you got married? 25. Wow. That's young. Mm -hmm. Were you already working? Yes. With your father in the I was uh, working, no, we, 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 at the age of 20s when I was doing my whole feasibility study for the, um, you know, for the taking the clothing factory right up to um, cotton farming and the whole lot. And we've done a lot of studies for that. Mm. We actually held browsers for that. But um, it brought us to the cotton value chain, from garments to textiles to cotton farming. Mm. And cotton had two things. One was lint and one was the seed side. So cotton seeds, you actually take and you crush. Uh, you crush the oil out of it, you get oil, cotton mm -hmm. seed oil, mm -hmm. and the balance is animal feeds. So when you look at those two value chains and went to farmers, had barazas uh, at the age of 21, 22, across Kenya, a lot of ambition, you know, want to do this, want to do that. Put it all together and said, fine, now this needs a full value chain approach mm. and it needs funding. Okay. So went to banks, wrote to banks, did a feasibility study, worked with one of our accountants and did entire financials. And we didn't have any money then. So went around and going to banks they say oh looks interesting but yeah. you have no experience you're just out of university have you ever done this before I said no but I've got a study here and I've got a plan I said it doesn't matter so this is a young lad you're ambitious but good plan but no you don't have experience mm -hmm. um, the other thing is uh, at one stage we went to IFC International Financial Corporation and the head there was a good guy and he says look young lad we've seen your study looks good. Do you have 40% equity? Wow. Now it's a major project for full value chain going from farming right up to processing, uh, ginning, uh, taking the lint, taking the cotton, taking the cotton seed, processing it all. And they said, look, if you don't have 40% capital, mm. you know, we can't fund you. So he, he gave us a good idea. He said, start small, start from one end of the cycle and then go backwards and do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started off from the soap side and started with soaps, go back into oils, go yes. back into farming, go back into crushing the seeds and into farming and that's what we're doing today. And that's what so that doing. same goal we've been doing and it's been 30 years now. Yeah. Um, away from work and of course you're spending time with your family, what else do you do? What else are you passionate about? Um, I do a lot of <coughs> uh, social work. I do a lot of work for not just for business. Uh, I spend more time actually doing a lot more social work in mm -hmm. associations and organizations and universities. I'm on three universities. I'm on uh, other boards where it's helping thought leadership. It's forming the, the, the whole system for, you know, a better environment. Yeah. Um, hospitals and uh, you know, various boards and associations. Mm -hmm. So helping that to sort out in terms of enabling environment. That is a good um, place to be when you're always able to balance it out. But also yoga, it's something I say you're the International Yoga Day. So this for you is what? What does yoga mean to you? 
Yoga is basically your daily uh, routine, your daily exercise, daily practice. Mm. Um, something simple as breathing, right? We're not born with an operating manual of how to breathe when you're born, right? So you've got to learn the breathing techniques which basically self-heals. Mm. And then yoga is basically simple stretches and stuff like that, which are done so that your body, your body, is then <coughs> aligned with your mind and soul. And once you align that, you're at peace with yourself, you know who you are, really are, and it, it helps to, to maintain your, your, your weight, your mind, your centeredness, and everything. You do that every day? Yes. What time? Early morning. And also, if, when I'm traveling from, you know, from home to office, on the way I can still do my breathing. Mm. So breathing is something we do all the time, but you've got to learn the technique of how to keep the breath in, and release it off, and remove the carbon dioxide, and you know, let the oxygen come in. Okay. So a few doors shut at the beginning for you with Bidko and with your brother getting into these ventures. What is it you drew from those lessons early on before you finally got your footing in terms of your business? I think very important lessons. Very important lessons learned that um, a lot of the old paradigm of banking was if you're not successful, you won't get money. Mm. And uh, the old style was um, unless you're experienced in it, you've been in it, you're not going to get that. So. At young age, I learned the lesson of saying, okay, it's important to see how to navigate, uh, how to find solutions to various issues because not everything is cast in concrete. The other thing is venturing out, venturing out into new things. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we've done in our business life, it's never been done before. So we're the first ones in pioneering in that. And the whole paradigm earlier was that if nobody else is doing it, you should be wrong. Mm. And that lesson learned for us was, hey, if everybody's not doing it, that's opportunity. Go for it, but really take a, a good move at it and, and find out. We've been at that level for long. Was it easy because your father had been you know, an entrepreneur doing business for you? Um, did he give you that helping hand or did he say, you know what, you're venturing in there, you need to learn the ropes by yourself? I think it helps to have <coughs> a parent who's been an entrepreneur as an icon, you see that, it's very valuable and I think that did help us a lot. But at the same time, I think it's that spirit inside you that is not stifled, where he would tell us straight away, look, don't worry if you make a mistake, you'll mm -hmm. learn from it. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not scared of making mistakes, number one. Number two, very important lesson was uh, never lose your credibility. Uh, you could lose your money or whatever, but don't lose your credibility because loss of money is not a big issue. But loss of credibility is everything. Mm. So he says, never default, never do this, never do anything, you know, uh, that is not proper and not legal. And that was important. Those lessons are very, very important. Yeah. So that was like mentoring, in a way. But uh, also being there as an icon, even he's there today. Mm. And, uh, you know, it just works like magic. Right. Why manufacturing? Why did you choose that line? Why not other industries? Why that particular one? Because it has many challenges. Um, and at the beginning, I imagine a lot of the things you need to manufacture, you're bringing in from outside. I think it was the whole process of converting from a raw material to finished products. And earlier on, we were, he was doing that with garments. He was getting in the, garment, the textiles and converting into garments and making something different from it. That was, I was more passionate about that. Mm -hmm. The service industry of insurance and, you know, selling and stuff like that didn't excite me. So I think that whole creation part has been a good thing and then making things better for, for people where they come from and the value added because you, you see a lot of raw materials and convert that into finished products. It's exciting space. Yeah. From that to oil, soap, what was that transition like? What informed that decision? So that was a planned thing from day one because the cotton value chain had that whole value chain and we saw that we could go from cotton to seed. The lint side and textile side we actually dropped because uh, imported garments from Far East and Southeast Asia were cheaper. People were also going for polyester, mm. um, less and less of cotton, so that was a big issue. But we then stuck with the other side, which is more of a consumer product, number one, food product, a daily need, and somewhere where you're not fashion conscious. Mm. Fashion business in the cotton industry was like you get 50% dead stocks. If a, if a color didn't work and you made black and white with red, and people didn't like it, right. you're stuck with it. Whereas in the food and uh, edible oil side, and the animal feed side, it's not like that. It's, 
it's standardized product. Mm. You're less into the banking business because in garment business today, people would give their products to the supermarket and they'd get money after 120 days. If the product doesn't sell, they say, I'm not paying you, take the goods back. Mm. So it was more of hit and run. And this was more of a condition that was more better. And also, I think um, at the starting stage when we were starting off, we were told that, look, if you go into this line of uh, oils and fats, Unilever will kill you. And that was something that stuck in the back of the mind. To say, oh, yeah? They're going to kill us. We've got to make sure we're going to be better. <laughs> and we actually studied for the first five years before we started off, what is it that they have that we don't have? Mm. What does a multinational have that we don't have? And that was a big study and that helped us a lot. I, immediately after my marriage, I went to Malaysia with my wife mm -hmm. and both of us, you know, for our honeymoon, stayed in the factory for three months. You took her to a factory? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> learning, learning, learning how to do the business, learning how to how it's done, how the process is done. Was she into it though? Was she into no, she was my uh, assistant taking short time <laughs> notes. <laughs> okay. So it was more of a, <coughs> a partnership where she yeah. came along. And yeah. And then we started off. So, so BITCO, is that an acronym or what does it mean? The acronym BITCO means BD company. BD is my father's name, BD Shah. Uh -huh. His name is Bimji Depa Shah. And his initials are called BD. So if anybody calls him BD, it's BD Company, Bitco. Okay. And in terms of shareholding, who owns Bitco? My father, myself, and my brother, three people. Equal shareholding? One third, one third, one third. One third. And we've seen you listed, 2013 Forbes list, um, richest Kenyan business person. That's sad. The next year, you see other figures coming now that, oh, it appears a father is um, a bit further ahead than son. When you see this kind of you know, rankings in terms of your wealth. What, what do you think about that? It doesn't excite me at all. I think uh, <coughs> when you start counting your wealth in terms of money and monetary affairs and all that stuff, I think it's not important. I think it's more important to see how much uh, difference you're making to the world mm -hmm. and of course how much richness that you have uh, rather than in money terms. I mean, come on, you can value things the way you want to do it and put in big values and stuff like that. I actually refuse to give an interview to Forbes because Why? I, don't, I don't think it's important to, to, to value people in money terms. I think it's more of look at people in terms of have they made a difference, have they actually helped more people. Yeah. And the benefit of, of, of happiness is, that's what we say, happy healthy living, that's what Bitco stands for. It's more of uh, can you create more happiness around where you sit. So our employees, our workers, our whole uh, ecosystem where we, we actually do business and of course the supply chains where we actually work with suppliers, customers and then the products that we make, mm. the consumers that consume our products, that's far more richer. So full family business, is there ever a plan to get public involved for this on stock exchange? I think when we talk about our family business, uh, we have a goal for Bitco and the goal is to grab, grow and sustain number one market share in the African markets by 2030. So with that sort of a big ambitious, we call it a big hairy audacious goal, uh, without a sort of a beehive, we think that yes, one day when we need to really grow rapidly, we will need to look at either listing or you know, inviting new investors in it. We're not averse to that. Yeah. I think our project in Uganda was, is a partnership and we actually did invite uh, other major players who know this plantation technology and we're working with them. So we have those partnerships there. So but, you, uh, yeah. but overall, we're going um, to go all over Africa. So when we go there, Yes, there will be some very formidable partnerships being formed there. Mm. Right now in Kenya, where else is it you're present? We're in Kenya, we're in Uganda, we're in Tanzania, uh, we're in Rwanda, and now uh, we're looking at Madagascar. We're looking at Ethiopia soon, and um, I think Eastern Africa first. Mm. And then once we've taken over Eastern Africa, we can then go back to either Southern or Western Africa. Yeah, and how many brands under... Currently, we're about 40 brands, uh, mm -hmm. our own brands. We also bought out the Unilever brands, Kimbo and Cowboy and all those. And that was a big Eureka moment for us uh, I'd imagine. to have taken that over because when you remember the bank manager telling you that Unilever will kill you, uh -huh. and that's a, a good moment for an entrepreneur to say, okay, yes, we've done it. We've done this. So that was a good thing. And I think it boosts your confidence too to say that if a multinational is operating in a certain manner, we can operate far better mm. in the same manner. And what do they have? Systems, processes, uh, people, technology, and of course the overall uh, operating systems, which we have. Mm. We have our ISO 9001s, ISO 14000, ISO 
18,000, ISO 22,000, we operate by those standards, global standards. We also practice Kaizen. So we wanted to make sure that we operate at no lesser than a multinational. Yeah. And today we're able to take decisions much faster, whereas a multinational is not able to do that. Mm -hmm. However, we also have to be wary that we don't become the same type of multinational when we grow all over Africa. Mm -hmm. So we're very wary about that being lean and being faster in decision making. Okay, 2013 turnover around 46 billion shillings. Where is that standing at now? Well, it's about $500 million, if I put it in dollar terms mm -hmm. uh, right now. We plan to go to a billion dollars in Kenya alone by 2019. Mm -hmm. So we have an aggressive 4x growth plan for Kenya. And of course, that's going to happen in other countries too. Yeah. How many people has Bitcoin employed? Currently across East Africa, we have about 7,600 people employed. In Kenya alone, in, in our Bitcoin, uh, in, in Tika alone, mm -hmm. and then in Akuru together where we do the crushing, we have about 2,200 people employed. Wow. So that creation of employment, significant for you, that you're playing that role in a country that unemployment is a huge problem? I think it's probably, in my opinion, it's a key performance indicator for everyone today, not only private sector, but also government. For anybody who calls himself a leader today, the first KPI should be, am I creating jobs? Mm. Am I creating good, fulfilling jobs across the value chains? And uh, whether you're a governor, senator, MP, president, the key performance indicators, how many jobs have we created? Right. Kenya's problem right now, we are actually, I'll talk it as, I'll say it as an opportunity rather, mm -hmm. is to create a million jobs per annum. And if we were to create a million jobs per annum, we wouldn't have any pr problem with our youth or unemployment. We're actually adding a million people to the job market every year mm. in Kenya alone. The same thing in other regions in Africa. So we really got to ramp it up and say, fine, what is it that we're going to do? Half of them will be in formal employment, half of them will be in entrepreneurs or informal em employment. But really, our, our key performance indicator should be creation of jobs. Yeah. I'll take you back to the leadership of the company because right now there's you, your father and your brother. And succession huge in politics. Is it also huge in business? And if so, what are the projections? What is it it's looking like for Bitco? I think succession everywhere is important and it should be addressed mm -hmm. while you're alive and kicking and you're doing <laughs> yeah. well. Not after you're done and over with and say, now, you know, I've mm -hmm. gone old. Uh, it's important. So we do have a succession plan. What we're doing is we're building an institution that is not dependent only on family. So we're saying there's shareholders, there's directors, there's manage operations, management and operations. And at every level, we're professionalizing everything. So it doesn't mean that it's only family members running the whole shop. Mm. So we have a lot more in management and operations. Practically right now, we have no family. Okay. It's basically all professionals everywhere. So as far as the ab above is concerned, we have, uh, you know, my brother has two children. I have one son. Two of my brother's children have already joined the business. So they, they're already, there's a set, their future Success. is set. <laughs> this is the business. Well, it's set, it was, it was their choice. It wasn't by force. Okay. It was their choice and they got inspired into it. And if my son is inspired, he's 16 right now, but if he's oh. inspired later on, he will also have an avenue to come in. But avenue to come in in a professional basis, yeah. not to say you're not the boss, no. You come in, you're an employee, and then you come up the ladders, and then you work. Yeah, because you don't want to then give a sense in terms of family handed to you, you know, just go do whatever you want to do because your future is, is safe and secure. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a hard working, this kind of, you know, work ethic that you still Absolutely, still and I think when you talk about family business and you talk about succession, I don't think it should only be family p people who, who succeed in that. If some people don't want to come in the business and want to stay as a shareholder, right. that's fine. Yeah. But actual operations people must be in there. If they're not in there, you professionalize, you keep people who are professionals. Yeah. Early on in business, you were importing from Malaysia to, to make soap. Are you still now in business bringing in stuff from outside in, in your manufacturing? We're still, yeah, we're still bringing in certain basic raw materials because our capacity to process them here has not yet increased. Um, however, we are slowly, slowly reducing all that because we've got about 10,000 farmers in Kenya where we contract farm them. They actually do uh, soya bean or sunflower farming for mm -hmm. us. We take the entire produce, we give them an offtake contract. It's formal. Before you plant, we give you a price, we tell you what we'll buy, and we pay them cash on delivery. Uh, we crush those seeds in the Kuru. We bring the oil back here and we give them annual feeds. In Uganda, we're also doing, uh, we've got a plantation. It's, it's 22,000 acres of plantation. 
our own and then we got our growers too. Right. So we're ramping that up in a big way and we're saying fine, let's go into more and more local production. And in that manner we can reduce the importation. However, demand is also growing and we're actually from Kenya, from Uganda, from Tanzania, we're exporting to 16 countries in Eastern Africa. Mm. And therefore that whole demand is still up there and therefore our processing plants still need to import to serve that need. Uh, but more and more we would love to have more and more agribusiness, mm -hmm. local production and really if we say in Africa we've got 60% of the unused arable land in Africa, uh, we need to make sure we make that productive. Yeah. So we're looking at major agribusiness initiatives going forward and we're looking at other value chains. What about um, the next frontier, different um, direction as far as your business expanding and getting into something totally different? Yeah. Is that something you're thinking about? Um, as far as Bitco is concerned, Bitco in Africa will remain in FMCG products. It okay. will not diversify from FMCG. FMCG means fast moving consumer goods, which means all your household products, your food products, uh, anything you require from when you wake up in the morning mm -hmm. till the time you sleep will be in that. Uh, we will not diversify Bitcoin into anything right. else. However, when we diversify, that will be individuals as investors going into other areas. Mm. If we do real estate or if we do flower farms, we also have flower farms right now, but that's not as Bitcoin. That's a complete separate entity where we are then shareholders rather than operators. Okay. There are also reports you got some uh, funding from International Finance Corporation into expanding your business. What exactly did that go into? So when we look at our growth plans and our aggressive uh, goal, uh, we're getting a lot more people coming and saying, can we fund you, can we finance you? And IFC obviously is, is a major global financier. And they came in and said, look, we'd like to look, work with you and make your strategy come, come alive. Yes. So your growth strategy, they want to help us make it a reality. One, because our systems are all conducive. We've got everything real time online. All our dashboards are online. We've got computerization. And of course, we follow all the laws, we follow all the processes. Mm. So they liked our company and said, we'd like to fund you. And they've actually funded us for some of our projects in debt, we, although we haven't parted with equity yet. Um, but going forward, they're also available. There are many other financiers coming and saying, either we do equity, debt. Yeah. So capital is not the problem today. I think that's an issue that we don't have that problem. But what people are saying is we can come and fund you and make this a reality. So we're exciting, in an exciting space right now and we yeah. see ourselves going forward becoming bigger across Africa. So as a successful player in the manufacturing industry in Kenya, what do you say about the environment to operate that the government has created that is in existence in the country? Is it a good one? As far as Kenya is concerned right yeah. now, it's a fantastic place to be in right now because we've got a complete new constitution. We have a whole new devolution plan where we've got the county governments and we've got the national government mm -hmm. and I think that's amazing because um, in the past government would only be focused we had a, a government would focus only on Nairobi, Mombasa, Nakuru and Kisumu and all the major places. Today we have 47 counties, mm. we have 47 governors. Yes we may have a, a bloated uh, MCA and all those <laughs> governments but overall I think the focus now is on 47 different leaders operating in their own 47 counties and looking at a vision for each county. That means we've got microscopic elements looking at their own area and see how to develop them. Yeah. And all are aligned by Vision 2030 to see where we want to go as a country. So I'm excited to see that this is going to be a huge space that opens up. Mm. Uh, although initially they don't have an operating manual again where they can actually see how to operate from, we're learning that. And I think in the learning sometimes we get a bit of noise and we get angry about it. But I think in the next uh, five years, by the time next elections come up, mm. people will have learned better of what to do, what not to do. Okay. Having said that, I don't think we should have been increasing the cost of doing business or increasing the cost of governance because you're governing the same 44 million or you know, increasing population and you can't have too much of governance. So what you've got to do is yeah. government should become a more of a facilitator. And that's where we need to get that operating system working well. So the cost of doing business is high. Now, when you say cost of doing business, we've got to look at it relative to who else are we competing with. Because everything is about relative competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis anybody we're competing with. So if we look at right now demand and supply, mm -hmm. all the goods that we consume here, how many of the products are imported and how many products are locally manufactured or locally made or locally processed? Um, 
in our very clear perspective, East Africa, uh, our services are growing much faster as Kenya, because Kenya is doing much more servicing to its neighbors. So the service industry is growing much faster than manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge area for improvement right away. So when we look at cost of doing business, cost of power, cost of energy, cost of transport, cost of labor, productivity needs to improve there, but also cost of factors that come in. We have a trade regime today which is fantastic. Mm. With East Africa community, we've got a full market access into East Africa. Kenya as a hub has market access into the whole of East Africa, which is 150 million people market. Mm -hmm. We've also got free duty, duty free access into the entire Comesa. starts from Egypt right up to Zimbabwe. And we've got market access to that market of about 450 million people, which means no tariffs, no duties, if you are manufacturing in Kenya. Now, we're also right now working on this tripartite, which means uh, East African community, Comesa, and SADAC coming into it. Right. So we'll open that whole corridor, the whole of Eastern Africa and Southern Africa and North Africa, will open up to, to that trade agreement. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? We have market access. Mm -hmm. Now, we have enough manpower available here who are unemployed. True. So the opportunity cost is low. We have enough land available, we have enough resources available, and we've got, you know, the market access. We've got a strategic location in Kenya with ports. Mm. We've got the Mombasa port, we're going to develop the Lamu port Lamu. now. With all those accesses, I think we're going to be in a fantastic position. What we need to do is for people to get up and say, fine, let us look at how to improve productivity mm. of everyone. Government, private sector, everybody. And yeah. we start looking at productivity as a payment. If the MPs were being paid, rather than increase their salaries based on what they talk about allowances, let's link them to GDP. Mm. Let's tell them if you increase the GDP of your county or of your constituency, you will now be paid better. Then the focus will still be how do I increase GDP. Yes. The same way in labor, in private sector, everywhere else. You increase productivity, you get paid more. So your sense is the counties should even at this particular moment not be asking for more money to counties, but talking about avenues in which they create that wealth and money at the county level. Create more wealth, you get more pay. Link it to performance. The minute we link it to performance, the only thing they will say is, how do I increase my performance? Right now they're talking about getting from national government or taking from somewhere, whereas the pie is not getting bigger. When the pie is not getting bigger and you're trying to get more allocations from the same pie, it's like a cake, right? Mm -hmm. If you want a bigger piece of the cake, but you let's make the cake, cake bigger. Yeah. Make, bake the, a bigger cake. And the minute we start doing that, the focus will change. You mentioned private sector development, and we'll talk about that shortly. But um, in terms of education, you are Chancellor at Jerome Gyogenga Denga um, University. What does that say in as far as uh, veterans in the corporate world being involved in uh, the stewarding of institutions of higher learning? I think it's very important, um, and it's quite crucial that a lot of students, a lot of the university students also come up to me and tell me, look, you're our mentor, you're our icon, I'm following you, we want to do the same thing. Same thing, I'm on USIU board, right. I was on the uh, Polytechnic, Kenya Polytechnic, which we converted now to Technical University of Kenya, and there I left after that was done. Um, I'm also on the Management University of Africa, and I think there's a lot to be done in education, a lot to be done in mentoring. And frankly, a lot of our people are born entrepreneurs. Mm. I see that spirit of entrepreneurship in Kenyans all over. They want to do things, they want to make a difference. What we don't have is a platform where we have people with ideas coming together, brushing their ideas and making them better. In fact, sharpening their tools. Number two is a platform where you've got incubators, where people say, I'll give a funding for this, right? Venture capital coming in. And then people starting saying, okay, let's make you better and bigger. Mm. Because we've got to do that. And I think it's the movement is starting now. Uh, the finance world has always been a bank. You always go to a bank for all that sort of financing. But the private equity and new, new people coming in, venture capital, has to start coming in. Yeah. If you go and see the innovation centers in most of our universities, they're doing amazing stuff mm. right now. They have so much of innovation, they've got new ideas. I mean, if M-Pesa was invented in Kenya for the world, yep. right? There's so much more if you look at MCOPA, look at a lot of other things that are coming through. Our youth have a lot of potential. Yeah. What we need to do is give them a lot more oxygen 
to make it happen. Yeah, and speaking of which, the president the other day at Strathmore, you know, challenged the investors locally to be able to mentor and provide opportunities for the young entrepreneurs. Is that something you've been deliberate on? Is it something you're doing? It's, it's part of my, my doing. And I think I like to draw the energy from youth because youth have so much more energy, passion, and to see the sparkle in their eyes, you know, it's just amazing. And I think giving them that oxygen is important and going forward, we'd love to do much more of that. Yeah, so it's something you'd see yourself giving more opportunities. And what are these that local investors can do? What is it you can... There's so much more that people can do. It's not about local investors or foreign investors. Any, everybody can do. It's to say, <coughs> get them to have an idea. Uh, there are many challenge funds right now where they say, come and give us a business plan, put it together, have an idea, put it such that it becomes a bankable project. A bankable project means it's sustainable. Mm. Sustainable means it'll do a good job, but also it'll self-sustain by getting some income in it. And I think the definition of sustainability now is not just environment friendly, it's also sustaining the business. They need those ideas, they need to be tweaking certain things. And then of course at the right time they need the right guidance mm. of what to do, what not to do. It's not always about whom you know and what you know, it's about how you make things happen and how you really are able to handle situations where things don't work out. Now a lot of people lose patience and um, people say, I tried my hand at doing this, I tried this. At Bitco we've removed the word try from our dictionary. Mm. You either do it or you don't do it. And if you need to do it, become determined, get it done and find a way out. Okay? Now find a way out ethically, not mm. monotically. Mm. But really there are solutions to every, problem. to every problem. And if we actually address this, our youth coming together, um, recently at Kepsa we've actually said, you know, in the next 12 months let's do 50,000 jobs. Let's look at how we can help create 50,000 jobs. So we've taken it as a challenge. And we're going to go across every industry, everybody and say, fine, let's do this. Mm. Train people, teach them. Teach in them. fact, um, incubation of people into industry. Let them just come and feel the industry. Let them be with you for a day job shadowing or even internships for three months, four months, five months. So you're doing that here at Bitco? We're doing that all the time. We have okay. interns right now presenting and we do that continuously. But I think it's going to be important so that they realize what their passion is. Mm -hmm. I think if our youth just realize what they're passionate about, what they want to be in life, who they really are, I think they go places. Yeah. You've been at the helm of private sector institutions that champion uh, the needs and the requirements there. What is it that drives your passion in terms of private sector development? I think we, very simply, my own passion is about making sure that the private sector is robust, it's operating on clear principles, mm. it's devoid of politics, it's uh, not used as a platform for getting into politics, but really doing the right thing for this country. Making sure it is clear, plain, and creating a better environment. And I think Kenya has become a very strong private sector um, arena, and a lot of neighboring countries really envy Kenya mm. for that. And I know we've uh, even uh, we've got a lot of business membership organizations coming to train in Kenya of how to get the private sector together and have a voice. At the same time, having said that, in Kenya today, the whole public-private sector dialogue system is amazing. We have a structured way of how government and private sector dialogue, mm. which is absent in many African countries. In fact, I would say in Kenya, we've got the best model today, where we have a structured dialogue with the president, you know, the presidential roundtables, We've got a special roundtable with the parliamentarians, speakers roundtables. We've got it with the judiciary. We've got it with the governors, governors roundtables, where we're able to bring in issues where people need to really talk and dialogue. Yeah. So industry brings the issues of these things. Government listens and really get things done. So you mentioned the roundtables and that kind of engagement and the platforms that have been presented. But there are those that critics that come out and say this is private sector closing up to government, then don't they lose leverage in as far as championing and pushing for things that they need done? Do you agree with that kind of assessment? Anything you do positive for a country, you will always have skeptics. You'll always have people who are negative. And you've got to understand why they come out negative. As long as there are 20, 30 percent negative, it's okay. <laughs> if it's 70, 80 percent negative, then you've got a problem. Yes. Um, there'll always be people who are jealous. There'll always be people who say, I can't do it, so how can they get it done? 
Uh, when we go and talk as private sector to government, we are not talking about personal issues at all. We never present our own company issues. It's all about cross-cutting issues. As private sector with CAPSA, CAPSA is now the apex body. It's got membership of KM, Chamber of Commerce, and another 70 institutions mm. who are all members of the, of the CAPSA. Now, within private sector, we also have issues. We also have problems where there's one view, there's another view, there's, a, there's different views, right? We allow that. But within the whole private sector, we're able to manage that and bring it to the close and say, fine, now we need to go to government with one voice. And that's uniting the whole private sector. Mm. That today in Kenya has happened. Now with that happening, we all are able to justify and give a rationale to say why we're doing things and what we're doing. One is in value addition, right? In value addition, we talk about starting from raw materials, getting into finished products. Right. In services, we start talking about how many services can be brought in and how to create an operating environment. Plus laws, where the law needs to be tweaked, where sometimes the law is a problem, mm. we're actually able to lobby for that and get it done. When we take this whole thing together, at CAPSA level, when we're talking to government with president level or speakers level, there's nothing personal. It's about cross-cutting issues. It's about national issues. And therefore, if people are complaining that there's issues, you know, people are cozying up or whatever, I don't think that's true. We also have succession. We're very clear terms, two years in and you're yeah. out of that. Right. Uh, at East African Business Council, now as chairman there, it's got a clear structure of five countries. We've got the same private sector. But it's not working that strongly in East Africa, whereas Kenya is far, far ahead. Yeah. Um, corruption is a big challenge in the country today. And in the interview recently with Chris Kirubi, he said the private sector is fueling this corruption, and actually grand corruption in government. Is it something you agree with? I think when you look at it from a, from a <coughs> perspective of corruption, what is corruption? Corruption is where somebody wants something done faster, or they want a favor, they want something, some rule changed, or some rule bypass where people close their eyes and say, fine, I mm -hmm. didn't see that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's speed money where you want something faster, so you actually pay that. And I think there's some institutional corruption that needs to be talked about. Um, corruption, first and foremost, is non-negotiable. We don't need it. But when it's collusion of people stealing from government, where well, you have two parties anyway, whether it's anybody not in government is private sector. So yes, there was always a giver and a taker. And we've got to make sure that we, at we attack both sides. Mm -hmm. Not always a giver and not always a taker. Uh, sometimes what it's, easy, it's easy to blame is government because that's the taker, yeah. right? But there must be a giver. And the giver must be somebody either in private sector or NGO or whichever purpose, local or foreign. Mm -hmm. And that's always private sector. So I'm just saying there's nothing wrong in that statement. But I think what is, is the issue is we must all tackle it together. First and foremost, it started with the top end saying we don't want corruption. And the minute we stop impunity being allowed, I think this is where the judiciary comes in very strongly. If we don't allow people to get away with corruption, number one. Number two, when the benefits are smaller of getting away with corruption, if we get this bill that's going to come through, which actually says if you've done something corruptly and you've taken that money, that money will be confiscated from you. Mm. Now, when those laws come in, we're all for that. We want to end corruption here. Because then you create such a better operating system. Let's look at our youth. Let's look at our million people we're adding every year. They don't want a corruption. They want a corruption-free society. They don't want to be in that. But they miss out on opportunities. So going forward, I think it's, it's important. The only problem is a lot of people look in the backyard and say, fine, all that had happened in the past was corrupt. I agree with that. Some things may be corrupt. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to sit with the driving your car by looking at the you know, rear view mirror, that's not the way. You've got to look through the windscreen and say, fine, where are we going now? Let's make sure we stop it now. And whatever is the backlog, let's look at that separately. But for now, let's make sure we stop it, we curb it, and we actually have systems. Now, for that, processes. Yeah. If your processes are transparent, online, real time, like we have. Now your tax process and everything else is online, real time. There's no room for corruption, mm. right? So the minute we make our processes more transparent, open, and remove the human intervention, right? Where people decide, and we also must fight it. And I think where people see something going wrong, we've got to speak about it. Mm. It's the moral authority and the right for everybody to speak out against it, not to say, "Oh, I can't do anything because I'm a small person. Mm. I can't say this." Use the systems.
sorry, you mentioned the judiciary and their role in all of this. And the analysts will argue that on one hand, there are legitimate issues that the court will need to you know, clarify, set the record straight on. But then there are those who use that process to either stop processes um, or you know, interfere with business and procurement of this or the other. Is it a sense you get that on one hand it's a good thing in that there is that avenue for legal matters to be conversed, but also it is abused by individuals who just want to put block after block after block? There are two ways to look at this, right? <coughs> as far as the judiciary is concerned, it's got a clear role, it's got a mandate from the Constitution, it needs to make sure there is justice in the country. Justice delayed is justice denied. So we must get this process to be far more robust and faster. And if somebody feels that they're not being, uh, or they're being compromised or something is going wrong, mm -hmm. <coughs> they have every right to go to court, but you need to get that jurisdiction faster. So whether it's right, wrong or whatever, it gets done quickly, rather than say, stop going to the courts. Because you don't, if you stop going to the courts, you're going to go to the court of public opinion, mm -hmm. where the media, unfortunately, rules, number one. Number two, you're going to go into violence and say, fine, let me take the law into my own hands right. and I will hit that person, I'll slap the person. I don't think that's right. Yeah. I think it's important that we go through the court system, but we must do that faster. It must be on time, in full, error-free judgments, number one. Number two, it also must be accurate, right, based on that. But at the same time, I think you can classify it as use the courts or misuse of the courts. What people are doing is misusing the court procedures, right, in order to delay processes, in order to delay projects, because they feel bad about it. But if somebody has a problem, let them go to the court, and within a week or two, if they get a judgment, things move on. Mm. That's going to be important. All right. So you, you should not ever say, you know, don't go to the courts, don't fight it. If there's something wrong, just with, live with it and let the process go on. Then you'll allow impunity. And yourself, um, perhaps familiar with how much these legal battles can play out in terms of the Tattoo City project, um, billions, multi-billion shillings project, and has been embroiled in legal battles beating the local shareholders against the foreign shareholders. A lot of that's still in court. What is it you can tell us in as far as this? Because the concern is this is a good project that is perhaps being derailed because of all of these sideshows, and it's, you hear this out of the argument, you hear the other. What do you say about this? Um, it's very clear. This matter is in court, so I can't talk much about it, mm -hmm. but the fact remains that uh, in the past we had one local shareholder against whom ourselves and the foreign shareholders were fighting, right? That, go <laughs> that went on for four years. Mm -hmm. and that was misuse of the courts. Very, very clearly. Okay. But today, as we speak today, we've gone to court because we want a judgment to say, let's audit the books. Mm -hmm. Let's get PricewaterhouseCoopers or somebody to audit the books and get the facts out there. Now, that's why we're in court today. Now, if that's being classified by people to say, that's criminal, that's wrong, then let the court decide. We've got a court order today saying, let this be audited by, by PwC. Right. That's all we went for not as individuals but as directors of a company to say uh, a company that is operating legitimately in Kenya must have audit accounts. That's our fight. Now that's being termed as delaying the project, doing this, doing that. I think that's wrong. Do the facts are not out there and the facts need to be out there. Are you concerned though for the manner in which the project is being implemented, Tattoo City? What are your concerns? In as far our, as biggest the concern, our biggest concern is that our Foreign shareholders are bankrupt and they want to sell the project in, in mass. And we don't want that to happen. We want this dream that was built by us. We invited the foreign investors to come in for our dream, right? And we want to make that happen. Do you think it will still happen in the timelines that were put up before? Let the course decide. And you, it might roll out for a very long time. Let's see. Yeah. We believe that Kenyan. Firstly and foremost, I think we believe in the Kenyan court system, we believe the Kenyan judiciary will do what is right. Yeah. Because we are very, very clear what we're doing is right. Okay. And we need to be accountable for it. And all we're saying is, be accountable. If you are right, why are you worried about anybody auditing your books? Mm. If you're not, you know, if you're not okay with this audit or that audit, why are you trying to skim that? I can't talk more on that. All right. Let's talk about the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. President Obama to grace that. What is the significance of Kenya hosting it and you know, having President Obama as well gracing it? I think 
first and foremost, um, it's a significant symbol of confidence in Kenya, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, I think it's a natural place for a president of America, who is President Obama, to come to, because partly he is Kenyan, whichever way you look at it. Mm -hmm. But overall, for Africa, right, uh, entrepreneurship is a big thing. And to, to have that here is significant in the sense that let's make sure that we actually arouse all our people to look at entrepreneurship in a way. Mm. All graduates today, in my opinion, should be entrepreneurs, should be looking at how do I do job creation rather yeah. than I will look for a job. Right. Okay. Why am I saying this? Because if you've got a million people going into the job market, how many graduates are we churning out every year? My estimate right now is about 55 to 60,000 graduates every year. Mm. Now, 55,000 or 60,000 graduates per year, and you've got a million people going in the job market. What are the 940 million who are not get deg getting degrees every year? What are they doing? Can we make sure that these 60,000 create jobs for those people? Yeah. But also, the others start looking at job creation, because that's important. So when we look at it from, from that perspective, having a global entrepreneurship summit here and really symbolizing it to say, fine, here we are, the Kenyan entrepreneurship spirit is big. Mm. But this is not a Kenyan enterprise, it's not a Kenyan uh, conference, it's a global, global conference. And I think Kenya is the right hub for it, so yeah. it's in the right place. What do you tell foreigners who'd want to do business here in Kenya? Kenya is absolutely open for business, Kenya has the most liberal policies, in fact, very liberal. We don't even have foreign exchange controls. You can do business here openly. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't even have issues around you coming in, you know, operating in Kenya. As long as you abide by the Kenyan principles, there's nothing wrong. So open for business. Kenya is the hub for the whole of sub-Saharan Africa and Kenya in rightfully, is rightfully placed for that. We've got huge uh, availability of human capital. We have the best of human capital in Africa, that's what I would say. Mm. Um, I think our people are quite smart in doing a lot of things. We have an operating system in government, in national government, which we are improving all the time. Mm. We're the fastest reforming country. And I think overall, I would say... The economy say is doing well, no? The economy is doing well. I have no doubt about that. Despite all the turbulence that we have, we're still doing well as an economy. And going forward, I can see that within East Africa, within Comesa, Kenya is still a place to be in. Um, having said that, we've got a regional economy and market access. We've got a lot going here. Yeah. Why are big corporates all headquartering in Kenya today? What's the reason? Why is Google here? Why is Microsoft here? Why is everybody else coming here? IBM headquarters here. Coca-Cola headquarters here. Unilever headquarters here. Why are they all headquartering here? Mm. Because this is a natural hub. We've got great climate. We've got a great operating climate, environment for business. And I think we're reforming everything else. When you start talking to whether it's the county governments or national governments today, they all have a vision of improving themselves. We have a vision 2030 for Kenya, and I think that's something we've got to keep on ramping up and making it happen. And everyone in terms of investing want to know that the investment will be safe. And security threat of terror has been a challenge the country has faced, and it's a story that many people out there get to see, watch, and hear about. So what do you tell them in, as far as is this challenge? But hey, still come and do business. Kenya is absolutely safe. Um, when you look at it, terrorism is a separate issue. It's not a Kenyan problem. It's not a Kenyan problem only. If you saw what happened in, in, in the North, North Africa mm. recently, right? 30 Britons were, were murdered. Tunisia. It happened in France, happened in Copenhagen, happened everywhere else. This July 4th, there's a big scare out in the US to say terrorism could hit mm -hmm. here. I don't think the world is the same as it was before. So Kenya is in the same boat as that. Even in New York today, there's a big terror uh, attack. Fear. Now, fear is one thing, mm. but the reality is another thing. The reality is, yes, we have some issues, but what is the gravity of the situation in Kenya? It's not as grave. So Kenya is secure, it's safe, it's there, it's open for business. All right. 44 million people are still surviving. Yes, we do have some issues. Yes, we had Westgate. Well, I also lost a brother, mm. right? We've had other issues. We had not Pegatoni. We've had the Garissa University. Yes, we have. But that doesn't mean the country is destroyed. It's destroyed. And, and therefore, yeah. the operating system in Kenya is open for all. For all. There were plans uh, to form a Kenya-US business um, council. 
What, what's the status of that? I think there's already very many institutions. There's the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. There's the uh, American, Chamber, American Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. here. There's uh, very many organizations. I don't think it's important to create many more organizations. The Corporate, Corporate Council on Africa from the U.S. is also really coming in here. We've actually given them space in KEPSA, but we're working together with them. The issue is not about that. I think the issue is bigger. The issue is Kenya is the best democracy today, right, in Eastern Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. And we've got to preserve that. We've got to make sure it survives. Now, America is also another icon for, for democracy. So if you look at these two, and really, sometimes some of our people tell us, oh, you should look at uh, you know, China and Singapore and Rwanda. And yes, the question that I ask is democracy, mm. right? We've opted for democracy. So we are paying the price for democracy sometimes. Things are a bit slower because decision making is not as fast as where it's my way or the highway. But overall, um, I think we're open for business mm. for US, for any foreign investor, including China. I don't think I would say we're not open for business with China too. Anybody who comes in with credible business, comes in with invest money and operate by our rules in Kenya, I think Kenya is a fantastic place to be in. Yeah. Going forward, what is it, uh, Bimal Shah, we should expect from him in terms of business especially? What is it uh, we will see? And also your message to young Kenyans, young Africans watching this interview uh, who want to follow your path. I think very simply, um, two issues. One is leading by example. Number two, there's so much opportunity. Look at every single challenge as an opportunity. Uh, do not get cowed out by people saying, oh, this is wrong, that's wrong, and there's nothing I can do about it. An excuse is what I would call bullshit, because stop using excuses. Rather than that, say the truth and say, fine, this is what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And we have a listening private sector, we have a listening government, we have people willing to reform, why not have dialogue? Um, I would say one thing to our youth in university today, very strongly, um, behavior, attitudes needs to be more positive. If something goes wrong today, all you do is come on the streets and start stoning people and a stone meets the windscreen and smashes yeah. it, and that's how your communication is. Rather than let's have dialogue dialogue, sort out issues, articulate issues in a proper manner. Mm. And really coming out from there, you will come out of the private sector. But overall, <coughs> I see a lot of potential. I'm still bullish on the market. <laughs> I'm still bullish on Kenya and we're investing a lot more money here in Kenya and expanding our capacities, although we're also investing in Uganda and other places. But we see a lot of potential for Kenya. Mm. I think there's plenty of opportunities. Look at all the new ways of doing business. There's going to be a complete sea change in 2020, 2030. I mean, just look at what Uber is doing. Mm. Okay? That's a complete new operating system. How many people understand what it's doing? In Nairobi today, we have it. It's launched in New York. Next day, it's here. Kenya is no more far behind in terms of technology. We've got bandwidth. We've got availability of smartphones. I think we're really set to take off. I'd mm. put it this way, that Kenya is like the plane that's going to take off. The engines are running, we've got a crew on board, it's sealed, we're ready to take off. So we need that huge energy when taking off. And I think we need to pool our energy together yeah. rather than against each other. And I would also tell all the politicians, right now it's not time for politicking. When it comes to elections in 2017, then fight it out. But right now, let's build the nation, mm. let's create jobs. Well done and well said. Thank you very much. Thank you.